Good. Let us pray, everyone. Father God, we thank you and praise you for this time that we can be together around your word. We thank you for that truth that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you, Lord, that your word gives us spirit. It gives us the oil in our lamp uh, to uh, enlighten us, to empower us. Uh, and so that we can, Lord, not only find light for ourselves, but we can be the light and bring the light and bring hope where there is despair and light where there is darkness. Enlighten us now, we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Great to be with you. I'm so relieved. I was stressed out wondering if I'd make it on time, but thank God I did. So, we are, and by the way, if there's anyone new here, a special welcome. We are doing what's called the Parashat Shavua, the weekly portion. We've got about four weeks to go before we finish, and then we're going to start in the book of Genesis. So we go through Genesis right through to Deuteronomy. We're, we're kind of toward the end of Deuteronomy now, and then we're going to be starting in about four weeks Genesis. But every week is important, um, and... Uh, today we are in Deuteronomy 26.1, and this is called in Hebrew, Ki Tavol, and it's from 26.1. It says, and it shall be when, when you have come into the land, which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance, and you possess it, and you dwell therein. So today I want to talk about new beginnings, because we're at the uh, context or the at the place where it's the end of the 40 years of wilderness for the Israelites. They have wandered long enough. A new generation has now risen up. And that new generation, they know who they are by now. Why? Because the book of Numbers, when God brought the Israelites into that wilderness, you know, you think that that wilderness is a God-forsaken, wasted space, but it's not. God did a lot in the people of Israel. He led them out of Egypt. He helped drain them, uh, empty them from that slave mentality, poverty mentality, and then he named them by individuals. He named them by families. He named them by tribes. He named them by a nation. And then he called those that are 20 years old and up to be fighters. So think about that just for now. Think about every Israelite who a minute ago was a slave. Now they're told to step forward as an individual to be counted. That's why it's called the book of numbers. You got to step, step, step up and be counted as an individual, and then in your family. So you've already got two identities, uh, uh, your own individual identity, your identity in your family. Step up in your tribe. What tribe? And remember, they had each tribe had a banner. So they, they identified with that tribe. And then as the people, the people of Israel. And now they're soldiers. God said, step up and be a soldier. I'm a slave. I was a, I was a farmer in Egypt. I was a mason in Egypt. I was a tent dweller in Egypt. No, no, no. Now, you, whether you like it or not, you're a soldier. Like when you immigrate to Israel, whether you like it or not, when if you're born in Israel, you are enlisted into the army. You got to step up. But there's one more step up, and that's when God said. Those that are 30 years old and above, you are to step up to be the priests. Originally, God's goal was that the whole nation would be a kingdom of priests. So they had to step up as well. And basically, that priesthood in, in general was to be uh, a, a, um, a, 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 not only a light to the nation, but a, um, a bridge between God and the people. A, remember, they were told to be storytellers. What kind of a thing is, what's so important about storytellers? God said to the people of Israel, you are to tell your children 
and your children's children about these things. And it's the same for you and me. We are to take God's word. We're to take the history. We're to take what we've come through. And we're to tell our children and our children's children, but we're to tell it in a way that 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 we want them to to catch. We want them to to believe in the miracles, the manna, the 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 pillar of cloud, the fire by day and night, uh, the manna each day, the the quails. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their their clothes. Uh, didn't wear out. God provided miraculously in that wilderness. And that's what the Israelites were to tell their children and children's children. That's basically what we're going to, uh, we're part of our calling to be storytellers. So now they are going into the promised land. And it says in De Deuteronomy 26 1, and it shall be when you have come in unto the land which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance and possess it and dwell in it. So this is new beginnings, new beginnings. And I, I gave an example the other day that I heard. New beginnings kind of can be like a piece of chewing gum. You put it in your mouth. It's tasty. It's exciting. It's refreshing. It's juicy. And then after a while, that excitement can wear off a little bit. And uh, so new beginnings, while there's an excitement about a new beginning, I think the reality of a new beginning is that whatever that new beginning is, there's always uh, this side of heaven, everyone, you all know this, I know, you all know that this side of heaven, any new beginning is going to have its challenges. You know, you get, you get married, how exciting that is. But the reality is that, you know, it's not all going to be uh, easy. Uh, you go on a holiday. Uh, you come back from a holiday. It's so like I said, half an hour ago, I was excited to come back home to Israel. And then I'm walking down to the passport control and I'm seeing pictures of all of our captives still in that hellhole of uh, Gaza Strip. That's, of course, if they're still alive. And then, of course, the reality of our brave soldiers fighting on the front line. So, re but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be excited about new beginnings. And that's why Zechariah 4.10, it says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. If you're at a place where you're thinking of or you're in the place where you're actually beginning something new, think of that verse. Don't despise the day of small beginnings for the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line. By the way, any day now, everyone, is Rosh Hashanah. You know what Rosh Hashanah is? It's the new year. It's the Jewish new year. It's where we take apples and honey. We dip the apples in the honey and we say to each other, may you have a sweet new year. And we blow the shofar. It's, it's uh, reminding us uh, that this is the new beginning. And we're blowing, asking the Lord to bless the new year. Just a second. Um, and uh, and it's also, uh, here's a beautiful thought about new beginnings. If you go back to Genesis 2-7, listen to what it says back in God's creation, where it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So when we think of new beginnings, everyone, we think of back into the creation story when God breathed his very breath of life into us, into our soul. We became uh, a, a living soul. And so the new year, the new year, new beginnings is a time that we, we think of, God, what can I do with that breath of life? 
that you breathed into my soul with that creative energy that you've given to me. And, um, and by the way, another reason why we blow the shofar at the new year, Rosh Hashanah, it's to remind us what happened when Abraham offered up Isaac. Remember, he, Abraham had that knife and the angel cried out, stop Abraham. And he looked over in the bush and he saw a ram. So it was like a ram's horn. And we, we were reminded of what Abraham did. But there's something more very, very special I want to share. God said, he, God not only said stop, but he said, Abraham, now I know that you fear me. And in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed. And you will possess the gates of your enemy. I hope that happens up in Lebanon. I hope that happens in Iran. And I hope it happens in the Gaza Strip. You will possess the gates of your enemy. But the key point is when God said to Abraham, Abraham, now I know that you fear me. What happened? Abraham gave everything. He laid down everything. He was emptied of everything because Isaac was everything to Abraham. All the promises of seed, of blessing were in Isaac. And Abraham was ready to sacrifice his son. So when God said to Abraham, now I know that you fear me, I actually believe it was not only for God to see, but those words, just imagine if you're Abraham and God says to you, Abraham, now I know you fear me. In other words, if I can paraphrase that, it was as if God was saying to Abraham, Abraham, did you know that you have that this incredible capacity to fear me? Did you know, Abraham, that you were willing to get to that place where you could actually offer up your son? This is, you know, the word that I'm, I'm thinking of, it's affirmation, everyone. God was affirming Abraham. He wasn't just saying, okay, Abraham, you've proved to me how good a man you are. It wasn't just for God. It was for Abraham as well. This is affirmation par excellence that God was la lavishing upon Abraham. Just like he said to his son when uh, twice in the New Testament, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, guys, take that and take some of the scriptures in the New Testament. For example, it says, we are accepted in the beloved. Uh, you know, uh, John 3, 16, all of these promises for God so loved us, the world. Uh, 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 while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more shall he free us? And so on and so on. And so, so think of that. If you've never been affirmed, if you didn't have good parents who affirmed you, you know, I had a really good father who uh, provided. I had a good father that followed me in sport, but he never really uh, affirmed me with words. He kind of did with actions, but not with words. Uh, maybe you've never had uh, uh, words of affirmation. Well, cathartically, put yourself in, or not cathartically, what's the word? I can't think of the right word. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Think of what you've given up for the Lord. Now, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think that God expects us to be today perfect because we're all on that journey. But think of what you have given up. Think of where you're at today and think of how God looks down upon you. You know, uh, Zephaniah 3 says, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rejoice over thee 
with joy. And, uh, and so many scriptures of affirmation towards us. You know, Paul has a phrase. He says, lay hold of that. Friends, lay hold of that. And he said to Abraham, Abraham, now I know that you fear me. I see what you've done. And, and Abraham, you have that. You, you, Abraham, maybe you didn't know you were capable of doing that, but you did it. And now in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your seed and you will possess the gates of the enemy. I felt I really wanted to um, spotlight that passage. Uh, when when we think of new beginnings, but, and I'll tell you why, because when the heat gets turned on everyone, when the going gets tough and we wonder, God, did I do something wrong? You know, am I in the right place? Because this is the reality of life. The Israelites are going to go in. They're going to come under attack. They're going to come under severe attack when they get into the land of Canaan. You know who who's gonna come out, who's gonna attack them? The United Nations. And I, I know I'm I'm joking, but that's what happened in those days. All the Canaanites, the Canaanites were a confederation of people. The Hittites, the Gergesites, the Jebusites, the uh Perizzites, and you name it. They were all gonna attack them, the United Nations of the day. And they were kind of going to come up with all kinds of strategies. What's changed, everything, everyone? Nothing has changed. But remember what God said to Abraham. And, and the people of Israel would have to go forward with that promise that, that, that was given to their father, Abraham. Abraham, I will bless you. I will bless you. Genesis 12. The blessing of the Lord was on Abraham and on his seed. Get out of your home, out of your people, out of your kindred, out of your nation. Go to the place. I will bless you. I will make your name great. Whoever blesses you will be blessed. Whoever curses you will be cursed. Through you, Abraham, all the nations will be blessed. And Abraham, you will be a blessing. That's why God blessed Abraham, so that he could be a blessing. So, the, this is, uh, you know, this is so edifying for us where we are in the 21st century. We are all seed of Abraham, either physical or spiritual. We've all been grafted in. And Galatians 3, it says the Gentiles, you also are the seed of Abraham by faith. So, um, you know, we have that blessing upon us made possible through Yeshua, the Mashiach, the Messiah, Jesus. So moving forward, and, and, and a couple of other things I want to say about Abraham, very important, is that remember um, that Abraham had to build an altar, everyone, to lay Isaac on. He had to build an altar. And I always like to bring out, if you look at Genesis 11, the building of the Tower of Babel, they were building up, 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 up. And what did they say? Let us make a name for ourselves. A name for ourselves. The next story in Genesis 12, Abraham was building down. He was building altars down. And God said, I will make your name great so what a contrast building up let us make a name for ourselves and they were and abraham was building down altars humble earthy not materialistic earthy and god said i will make your name great you know if you look there's a really interesting story in x chapter 8 it it was when um, um, Philip, Philip was going around doing miracles and demons were getting cast out. People were getting healed. The anointing was on him. He was laying hands on lots of people. Well, 
Do you know the story about a man called Simon the Sorcerer? This guy, Simon, he liked what he, he was a sorcerer. He also had a following. But guess what? He actually believed Philip. He believed what Philip was preaching. It says he believed and was baptized. But then he made a mistake. He liked what Philip was doing. And he said, can I pay for the Holy Spirit so that I also can lay my hands on people? He wanted the attention. He wanted the limelight. And, and uh, Philip, actually, it wasn't Philip. It was Peter. Peter was angry and he says, may you and your money perish with you. And then he said this, he said, uh, I see that you are full of a gall of bitterness. And he discerned that he had a root of bitterness that something obviously happened in his life that caused that root of bitterness. But he obviously wasn't healed of that bitterness. And so he was trying to compensate for that hurt in his life by trying to make a name for himself and get a ministry for himself. And, uh, and uh, Peter said, Nothing, uh, you know, uh, take your money and may it perish with you. So Simon the sorcerer, he realized he was exposed. So he said, pray to me that this doesn't happen. Instead of repenting and giving up, he still held on. He said to Peter, you pray for me. And um, guys, what are we hanging on to? Do we have any bitterness? Do we have any root of bitterness? Anything that we're hanging on that can turn out to actually be a stumbling block for us? But the point that I was trying to make, let me get back on track, is we as we go ahead, everyone, as we go ahead, do you know one of our strategies for going ahead for this new beginning? This may sound weird, to the to the the natural world we need altars we need to build altars everywhere we go what does that mean it means prayer fellowship dedication everything we do as we move forward we got to build altars that's what the lord said to joshua joshua is now the new leader moses has he's he was buried a few weeks ago Remember, we buried Moses, and but before he was buried, Moses laid his hand on Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, don't let this book of the law depart from out of your mouth, but meditate on it day and night. So God, as we go forward, everyone, we need God's word and we need uh, uh, altars for, uh, for, uh, for dedication and uh, devotion to the Lord. And guys, you know what this is? The, these altars, these are symbols of humility, humility and dependence in God. Humility and dependence in God. Why do I say that? Because look at verse one, go back to Deuteronomy 26, one, and it shall be when you have come into the land, which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance and you possess it, and you dwell. So once you've possessed it, that means you're succeeding. Things are going good for you. That you shall take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, the first fruits, which you shall then bring of the land of the Lord your God that he gives to you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place which the Lord your God shall choose to place his name there. So basically what he's saying, so imagine you're an Israelite, you come into the land, you, you, you sow your seed, you work hard. It's not going to be easy. You know, tilling the ground, finding the water, that takes work. That takes strategy. That takes a, a bit of investigation. Finally, you've sowed the seed. You've got to wait. Then there's that period, everyone, of waiting, of being patient and Finally, you see the first fruit and you think, hallelujah, time to get ahead. By the way, can you imagine, can you imagine 
before you come into land, just when you're on the verge, you haven't quite crossed over. I'm sorry, I'm saying let's go back a step. You haven't quite crossed over. You're about to come into land. Can you imagine what you might be thinking coming into land? I guarantee that there were some Israelites who were kind of waiting to go into the land, thinking, planning. You know, when I get into that land, I'm sick of this 40 years of wandering into the world of this wilderness, same old manner. When I get into land, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I see this other tribe, you know, I'm going to, uh, I've heard what they're planning. I'm going to do something different. The, 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 remember I've talked about the evil eye, everyone. Imagine some people's evil eye the competitive nature i want to get better than the 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 smiths or the joneses or in this case the 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 cohens and the levi levis you know and um and uh i'm gonna i'm gonna build a three story house not just a two story and you, ambition can take over uh but now god is saying okay when you come into the land the first thing you are to do when you see that first fruits is you bring it to the Lord. Now, what is God doing? Is he holding you back because he doesn't want you to get ahead? Is he a meanie? Is he a party pooper, you know, and all that? No, I, I think what he's doing, he wants to make sure that our ambition and our ego and our senses, remember I've talked a lot about the senses, the eye, the ear, the smell, the touch, the taste, that it's it's crucified everyone so that we don't get ahead of ourselves. It's for our own good. We may think it's for our bad. We may think, you know, you know that verse in the in the Bible, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Well, have you heard some people say also the stops of a good man? are ordered by the Lord. Sometimes I hate them. I want to get ahead, so to speak, whatever whatever that means, getting ahead. We think we're getting ahead. But I think the older that I get, the more I realize through looking at the scriptures that God knows what he's doing. He, he, he's the all wise God. And he always has a reason why he has these commands. And what a blessing that we, today, we can study from the Israelites' experience. So when God, completely out of the blue, he says, by the way, when you come into the land and everything's going good, by the way, bring me the first fruits. So instead of taking that first fruits for yourself or selling it on the market, because you know that down the road, the Canaanites have a big market and they're just wanting what I'm growing. No, you've got to first bring it to the Lord. This is hum this is humbling. This is for our humility. This is to break our, our uh, fleshly ambition and our ego, everyone. We've got to have our ego crucified. The ego and the independent nature needs to be crucified. And at the top of page two, like I said, we've got to still keep building those altars. Keep going down, everyone. See, the, the flesh wants to build up, wants to get higher, wants to get bigger, wants to, to uh, look better. But look at verse three. And you shall go unto the priest that shall be in those days and say unto them, I profess this day unto the Lord. And by the way, this is after you've taken your first fruits. You're to go to the priest and you're to say, um, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God that I have come into this country which the Lord swore unto our fathers for us to give. And the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord. Notice the altar of the Lord thy God. And you shall speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became there a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid us upon us 
hard bondage. So that's what they were supposed to do. You know, God's formula, everyone, God's ways are so, Isaiah 55, your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. Guys, sometimes we don't know why he leads us this way, why he uh, 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 creates certain uh, uh, situations in our lives. We don't understand why. Some, sometimes it's only afterwards. But what, what I'm sure we all can experience is the sense of breaking, the sense of um, frustration even, if I can use that word, frustration. And that's why we're to constantly seek after answers. God, why? What's the purpose? And when we turn to God's word, his, his word sheds light upon us. And I love that verse in Isaiah, which says, God is near to the broken hearted. He is near to the broken hearted. So even if it is a breaking, everyone, we can't lose the building of the altars and the the breakingness and uh and we're to remind ourselves of where we've come from my father was a syrian an aramean a wanderer we were afflicted but god brought us out and then it goes on in verse seven and this is everyone as we move forward into new beginnings we need a spirit and an attitude of thankfulness and rejoicing Verse seven, and when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and on our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And he has brought us into this place and has given us this land, even a land that flows with milk and honey. Now, we can look at the Israelites where they were at. They come into the promised land. Uh, they've finally got their first fruit. But before they can once again move ahead, they have to go through this ritual where they take the first fruit, they go to the priest, and they remind themselves and say out loud, I'm a sinner saved by grace. My father was a Syrian. We were in bondage, the house of bondage, and God saved us by his grace out of the land of Egypt. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And, um, and now to develop an attitude of praise, of thankfulness, of appreciation. Remember, remember the song that we all sing, Gary, Didi on uh, Passover? Do you know that song? Die, die, anu, die, 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 you know? die, 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 yeah, and and it, and it means even if God had left us in the wilderness, we would be thankful, and even if the Lord had not done these great things, we would have been thankful. And in other words, we haven't yet arrived at our dreams, at our goals, but even though we haven't arrived there yet, die, anu, which means it's enough today is enough for where I'm at. So it's developing, it's nurturing, cultivating, like tilling ground, a heart of attitude, gratefulness, appreciation for what we have today. And, um, you know, that, that sometimes, you know, can take a bit of work, especially if things that we're dreaming of and aspiring to have got a grip on our heart. And it's pulling our heart faster than actually we, we need. So verse 7. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry. No, not verse 7. We just read from 7 to 9. Uh, from verse 10. As, as the Israelites are moving forward. Verse 10. And now, behold, I have brought the first. And this talk about obedience, everyone the righteousness of obedience. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land, which you, O Lord, has given me, and you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord thy God. 
So the point that I wanted to bring out in this is just, this is a pure act, whether you, whether you, these Israelites liked it or not. Do you know, sometimes obedience is painful, painful. You're telling me that when Abraham offered up Isaac, that he was having fun? No, it was painful. Walking in obedience, everyone, sometimes is very painful. Crucifying the flesh is not fun. Paul said, I die daily. This is our call as followers of God. This is the call for the Israelites to go through certain rituals, to walk in obedience. And now I've brought these first fruits, uh, verse 10, into the land which you, O Lord, have given me, and you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God, in verse 11, and you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God has given unto thee and unto your house, you and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. In other words, share the blessing, the, the little blessing that you've got. If you learn to share it with someone else, actually that little blessing turns out to be a big blessing, doesn't it? Just a tiny little thing. Reminds me of one of the stories at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Jerusalem, uh, the Yad Vashem. You remember you go around the Yad Vashem and you see all these personal stories? There's one story, I, I've shared this before, of, uh, of a, a religious Jew who was in darkness for month after month after month. And the place that he was uh, in this ghetto, there, there appeared a crack in the wood and um, a bolt of sunlight shone into that room and it hit his face and he was looking up while that bolt of sun was on his face and the heat and the warmth and the light. He said, well, I was, well, I, well that sun was in my face. He said, it was as if I was in heaven just standing there in this ghetto where I had lost everything. But that moment of sunshine and warmth, it just took me out of my darkness and despair and it lifted me into the heavens. That's a, uh, 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 I, I, that's one of my favorite stories at the Yad Vashem. But it's a simple illustration of us finding the good, finding the positives, finding uh, things to be thankful for. And then, uh, 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 be, and, and the, point, the point being, everyone, the point that I'm trying to make in this issue of, of obedience, you know, for many years, I hated that word obedience because it was kind of, it, it I mean, I, I know the importance of it, but just the sense of um you know, when especially if you come from a, a, a synagogue or a church, which can be very legalistic, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you don't like rules and regulations. And so sometimes that word of obedience uh, can have negative connotations. But uh, there is the, a, the blessing of walking in obedience. There, It is hard. It is tough. As I, as I mentioned, the Lord said, you know, if you want, want to be my disciple, you have to uh, uh, take up your cross daily, deny yourself and follow me. But the, the, it, there's a beautiful verse in Romans 14, 17. Listen to what Paul said. He said, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, meaning it's not physical things. It's not materialistic things. But it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. What did he mean? There's three things he mentions. Righteousness, peace, and joy. The first thing is to find the right thing to do, the righteous thing to do. Whether it's comfortable or not comfortable, whether we like it or we don't like it. When we make a decision to walk in that obedience, there comes a peace 
the kingdom of God is righteousness. Then the next level is peace. It gives us a peace that we're doing the right thing. And of course, the devil can't condemn us, can't criticize. And then the third step is joy. It goes, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And the Lord put it a different way in Matthew 6. He says, therefore, do not worry watch what we shall eat, what we will drink, or how we will be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, meaning the non-believers. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. So think about that, everyone. When Israel are going into the promised land, Think about if, if, if Yeshua was saying the same thing to the people of Israel. When you come into the land, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. All these Canaanite peoples, they are the things that they worry about. But instead, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the right thing to do. And all these other things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So not allowing our mind to get the better of us or to put it in a different way, um, stop feeding on the tree of knowledge, everyone. Stop wanting to know that knowledge what's around the corner, what lies ahead, what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to drink. What if we, what if we uh, fire against Hezbollah and against the Iranians? What might they do in retaliation? You know, worry, fear about the future. What if I bring my first fruits to the Lord? What if I don't have enough food for my own family? Or how am I going to, you know, uh, get money at the market if I give the first fruits to the Lord. No, just live in the moment. That's what God says to do now. Just live in the moment. Because, guys, sometimes, and, and, and let me just kind of come to the um, summary of what I'm trying to say as I'm talking about the theme, new beginnings. <clears throat> new beginnings, as I said, at the, at the beginning today, there's always the excitement of a new beginning, but there's usually also other emotions, apprehension, fear, concern, worry, anxiety, um, you name it. Um, and sometimes, actually, a new beginning, it, it can actually even be disastrous. It can seem disastrous. For example, remember when Gideon, he had his army of 32,000 uh, Israelites, and he saw the enemy, the Midianites, who were 185,000. And Gideon was ready to go to battle. And he... He thought that his army of 32,000, which was about 22% of, uh, of uh, the Midianites, at least he, he thought he had some chance of winning. But then guess what happened? God said to Gideon, Gideon, there are too many of you. There's too many. And Gideon's probably thinking, what do you mean too many? We only have 32,000. There's 135,000 Midianites. God said, no, 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 there's too many of you. I don't want Israel to boast and vaunt. All those that are afraid, tell them to go home. So 22,000 left, leaving Gideon only 10,000. So now the situation is getting worse. And then the Lord says again, Gideon, there's still too many. And then remember the story, he took them to the, the that that spring at the, the pool of Mayan. That's a place that John Hodges and we go to every tour. It's, we believe it's the actual spring. 
in the uh, the Jezreel Valley there. And he tried them. He tested them. And only 300 who, who brought their the water up to their mouth uh, were chosen. And God said with these 300 who, 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 while they were drinking, they also had one eye on the battle. And with that 300, Gideon, I'm going to defeat Midian. And what did they do? They took their jar. This was a strategy. They took a jar. And inside of a jar, they had a candle. What did they do? They broke that jar. And then the light shone. And when the enemy saw that light, it, they sent they were, they were sent into confusion and they ended up killing each other. And this is a symbol, everyone, of brokenness. This is what Paul said. He said, we have that treasure. We have this treasure, Yeshua, in earthen vessels. And when we walk in brokenness, like I quoted, God is near to the brokenhearted. Then the light shines out. And we experience joy. We experience the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We experience the light. We experience the joy. And then we can bring that joy. And our enemies are defeated because we drive out darkness. That's what the victory is all about. We're, we're, see, we're, we're so surrounded by darkness. The enemy wants to bring darkness to each and every one of our lives, keeping us in darkness. And that darkness leads to despair and, uh, uh, and a sense of hopelessness and lostness and wandering and confusion. When that light comes, that darkness is driven out, the despair is driven out, and this is where we find more and more and more salvation. Yeshua, the light of the world. And then we rise up also as what he called us. He said, you are the light of the world. So let me finish, everyone. As we think of this new beginning, as we move ahead into, into the land, the land with giants, the land with fortified cities, the challenges that we are facing, unbelievable. You know, I'm, I'm happy to be back in the land, but, you know, uh, while it's joyful to be back here, uh, what giants that surround, you know, where, where I'm living in Zikron Yaakov, it's right opposite Caesarea. Remember Caesarea Maritima on the Mediterranean? Uh, I just got a text saying that all of the skies from Caesarea North are closed, meaning no planes, no hang gliders. They're all uh, out because of the danger up in the north. We're facing some very serious dark days. In fact, at our prayer meeting last night, Ramona, she's been hearing reports that if Hezbollah and the Iranians decide, remember what they did in, in July? They sent 350 missiles and rockets. Remember, they've got up to 200,000. What would happen as many people have been discussing, what would happen if they sent 3,000, 4,000 every day for the next week? That's their capability. And they would still have plenty of arsenal. The, this is, there's reports that we could be at that place. If they decide to really launch heavily on us, it could be a very bloody time. But our times are in the Lord's hands and we cannot let fear get in because ultimately, everyone, ultimately, the promised land is a picture of our eternal joy and happiness when we are going to be with the Lord. Do you know every one of us from the day we're born, we have a destiny and that's death. I know that sounds morbid and negative, but it's true. It, the, the big question is, is how, when is that day? How are we going to die? We don't know that, but we all have that destination. In the meantime, we get on business. We do our business. We do what's in front of us, but we have this uh, anchor for our soul. It's called the helmet of salvation, the helmet of hope, which is our salvation. 
Because if there's no resurrection from the dead, everyone, then Paul says we're to be the most pitied and we're still in our sins and we may as well eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we diet or we die, I think Paul said. But then he says, no, Christ has risen from the dead, the firstborn among many. This is our hope, everyone. So let me finish with a psalm, Psalm 24, which is a psalm of crowning the king. That's what the new year is all about. And every day that should be, uh, as we face every day, crowning the Lord as our king. And we are his subjects. He's the king of his kingdom. We are the subjects of his kingdom. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Notice it says, from and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That word salvation is Yeshua. He shall receive righteousness from the God of his Yeshua, Jesus. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, Selah. And where it says, lift up your heads, you gates and you everlasting doors. Remember what the Lord said to Abraham? He said, Abraham, now I know you fear me. And in blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your seed. And you will possess the gates of your enemies. May we go with that incredible affirmation that God gave to Abraham. The Lord is smiling down uh, at us. And you know why he's smiling down on us? Because in Psalm 24 that we just read, verse 6, it says, This is the generation of those who seek you, who seek your face. God's face is always smiling. The devil tries to confuse and lie to say he's upset, he's angry. And we walk around with the shame and this guilt and this fear and this condemnation. That's why Adam and Eve put fig leaves to hide that fear and shame and guilt. We want to take those fig leaves off. Why? Because we're at the cross. We're at the place where the blood was shed. The blood of Yeshua, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. He is our king of glory. So guys, lift up your heads, move forward into whatever new beginning, even if it's just today. Amen. Thank you. Amen. You know, you know, uh, Aaron, you know what Selah actually means? The word Selah, it means pause in his presence. Mm, nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Pause. Amen. Amen. Well, if anyone's got any thoughts or comments, um, and if you don't, that's fine. We'll We'll go into prayer. But if you do, feel free to share. This was just such a rich message. I really appreciate it. Um, I do have a question that's kind of not related, but um, it has to do with reading all the promises to Israel. Um, I, I want, since I'm not Jewish, I, uh, I don't want to be guilty of replacement theology, and, but sometimes the thought goes through my mind when there's a promise to Israel, does this apply to me as a Gentile? And I instinctively, I believe it does because I'm grafted in, but I do sometimes have that passing thought. I don't know if you have any thoughts. Mm -hmm. 
if you know what I'm talking about. Yes, absolutely. So <clears throat> the way the way I interpret scripture is I look at the primary text and then there is the secondary and sometimes the third. And that means this. It means you got to look at who wrote what we're reading, who was it primarily written to and for. Okay, so in this text, Deuteronomy 26, it was written, uh, uh, it was spoken to the Israelites and it was recorded. Um, and uh, so that's the primary source. But then you can look at the secondary source and say, okay, does that apply to me? I think one of the one of the uh, errors we do when we read scripture, we come straight to the scripture and we we're, we're hungry and thirsty. So we want to feed on, we want to say, give it, give me, give me, give me, give me. And, and I always say, okay, you know what? We'll get there. We'll get there. Just first be patient. First, let's break it down. Let's study what its primary source is because the more we dig into its primary source, then when it's time for us to, to apply it to ourselves, there's even more richness and it's even more satisfying because we're we're applying it from its correct contextual background. So um I, I hear your question, Kathy. So as long as we we are not reading into the scripture, you know, something like like, you know, like okay, let's go back to the story of Abraham when God said to Abraham, uh, okay, Abraham, now I know you fear me and blessing, I'll bless you and multiplying, I'll multiply your seed and you will possess the gates of the enemy. That verse was written and spoken to Abraham. But mm -hmm. then what we can say, okay, how does that apply to me? Well, it applies to me by saying, you know, that if I fear the Lord and I give him everything, well, knowing God's nature, there's a blessing. There's mm -hmm. a blessing in that. Now, to what extent he's going to multiply my seed and to what extent I'm going to possess the gates of my enemy, I don't know. But mm -hmm. I think it's perfectly legitimate to, to lay hold of that promise, mm -hmm. knowing that that's the nature of God, because it's, it, it's right through the scripture, that if you fear his name, that there's consequences, there's blessing uh, in that. Um, as long as I think we don't get, uh, we don't run away with it. Um, does that help? Oh, answer? yes. Yes. No. I appreciate that. Thanks. Welcome. Yeah, I, I shared also, I shared also in, in chat about, about the word evir, you know, the Hebrew, he, he, evir is Hebrew for Hebrew. It comes from the root word, the root, the, it comes from the root of IVR, which means to cross over. In a spiritual sense, anyone who has crossed over into the kingdom of God is an Ivri or Hebrew. And for that reason, perhaps Paul said that being a Jew is a matter of having a circumcised heart more than circumcised flesh. Mm -hmm. he, wasn't by any means re he wasn't by any means negating circumcision. He was emphasizing that to cross over into the kingdom of God, there must be an inward change. So those who worship God, worship it in spirit and in truth. And Romans mm -hmm. 2.9 says, but he is, he is a Jew who is one inwardly, the mm -hmm. circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, yeah. not by the letter. And his praises is, is from men. It's not from men, but from God. So to be a Jew is to be one inwardly, in mm -hmm. my opinion. So that's, yes, that, that's yeah, very helpful. Yeah. Can, I, can I interject here, please? Uh, I've just turned back to uh, Gary's notes about um, the Lord rewarding compassion and gener generosity. And also back to your um, story about Abraham hearing from God saying, now I know um, that you fear me. Um, some years ago, when I felt condemned and under um, cond um, bondage and that, all that sort of thing, I went for prayer to a, a gentleman who has a prophecy uh, ministry. And he said to me, do you love God? And I didn't know really with how honestly I could respond. Did I love God for what he does for me or did I just love God for himself anyway? So he stood in silence for a few moments and asked God. And then he said, God knows you love him. And to me, yeah. that's my Abrahamic um, moment. God knows yeah. that you love him. And then I was raised in a household which was poor. 
But my parents are believers and they welcomed anybody who was hungry and anybody who was homeless. And yeah. I've inherited the gene. And my sister says to her husband, we are keeping an open home. Anyway, uh, it was um, put, uh, I was given the opportunity to care for four or five elderly folks in their, in their times of need before they passed away. And now it's my turn. And I'm finding that my Christian brothers and sisters are, and others too are ministering to my needs without my having to ask anybody. Mm. Yesterday evening, I, had, I was going to a meeting at church and um, it was getting a bit dark and my opposite neighbours saw me going to walk to the bus and it meant crossing a field and going down a footpath. And the neighbour said, you are not doing that. I am taking you. Mm. And you know, I didn't ask her for help, but the Lord just happened to get us to coincide at the psychological moment. <laughs> and he's, all, he's always doing things like that for me. I can't yeah. drive anymore. So he just gives me what, what I need um, all, the, all the time. And it's amazing. And it's wonderful. Oh, it's my it's actually my turn. Yes. Yes. That's wonderful. That's so encouraging. It is, isn't it? Yes. Yes. I I can't help telling everybody I live in the hands of God. Yes. Beautiful. That's wonderful. Yes. Right. I had a couple of just a, a quick thing is that I thought when when they bring their first fruits in, when they're in the land, and. Yeshua is the first fruits. So I don't know if there's a correlation, but I that came to mind when, you know, they're bringing in and he was sacrificed and, you know, it's our first fruit from the dead. Yeah. And then the other thing is that I think of, you know, as we come to this anniversary of the attack on October 7th mm -hmm. and Israel is preparing for, you know, what may happen then, but it's also whatever that, that day a year ago was you were celebrating, I think, after Tabernacles or the last day of Tabernacles. So you have to look at that anniversary when that falls this year. Mm. To I'm not sure when that is. It must be mid October or end of October, I guess. You know, that would be because that would be the anniversary of that of that um uh, festival or holiday or feast, yes. whatever. Uh, yeah, if I remember correctly, October the seventh was it was Simchat Torah, which is the rejoicing yes. of the Lord, which is usually right at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Whenever but that like... falls this year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Usually, usually it's late September, something like that, where Feast of Tabernacles begins. 24th, 26th, 28th, something like that. But I love what you mentioned, uh, Audrey, about the um, Yeshua being our first fruits. Exactly. We don't have a temple. We don't have the priests. But what we can do with our altars, with our devotion, is we come and we say, Lord, I don't have anything, but I have Yeshua. I bring him. He is my first fruits. And, and you know, and and even, even um, uh I mean, other people do devotions in many different ways. Uh, you know, they they will give the first fruits of their day. They say, no, I'm going to put aside things that I want to do. I just want to dedicate the, that first moment of my day. And it's, it's like with fasting. Some people, they, they can't necessarily fast from food, but they may fast for a few days from a, I don't know, a uh, cell phone or television or coffee or whatever, something that's a little bit of a sacrifice. So, you know, God's not religious. He, It's our heart that he wants. He didn't want Isaac. He wanted Abraham's <clears throat> heart. So, um, but definitely we come, Yeshua, he is, we bring him every day. We come, that's what I think the Lord meant when he said, no one can come to the Father, but by me. He is the first fruits, a beautiful reminder. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, or, and, um, Jane, just thank you for sharing what you shared. Um, that's beautiful. You know, you said you came from a poor family. I, I think of the, when you said that, I thought of what Paul said. He said, I, I, I owe nothing 
and yet I possess all things because of the deeper, richer, richer things. And the, <clears throat> the other thing that came to me too is, do you remember Derek Prince, his first wife, uh, Lydia, she was uh, the the uh, director of a, what do you call them? An orphanage for girls, Arabic girls. So when he married his first wife, which who, who happened to be 20 years older than him, he adopted, I think it was eight or nine girls when he married Lydia. <clears throat> and uh, I always remember Derek saying that those years were very hard years where, where they had to pour out their lives, not only into the ministry, but to helping raise those girls. But then he would always say, as we have got older, it came back to us. And the verse he, that he would always quote is that verse in Ecclesiastes, which says, cast your bread upon the water, and after many days it shall come back unto thee. And it's, uh, uh, I hope it continues to do that for you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, Aaron, I loved what you said about the Tower of Babel um, being a building up and then with um, Abraham building down. I had never thought of it that yeah. way before. <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, it made me think about how I can apply that to my own life. Um, Am I prideful? Am I humble? Do I lift people up? Do I bring people down? There's so many different aspects to that. And, yes, you know, I have Amen. a lot of thinking to do. So yeah. I wanted to thank you for that. And I am happy you made it back home. <laughs> thank oh, you, people. Catherine. Yeah, <laughs> it's good to be back. And the other thing about that correlation between Tower of Babel and Abraham, yeah, one was building up, one was building down, and one said, "Let's make our let's make a name for us." And God said, uh, "God, it was God who said to Abraham, Abraham, I will make your name great." Abraham didn't have to worry about his reputation. God said, "Abraham, get out of your country, your name, your your people, your kindred." Go to the place, I will bless you. I will make your name great. I mean, I don't know what that means, make your name great. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, don't have to, we don't have to build ourselves up and build our ego up. Uh, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, it says in the Amen. Bible. Amen. Yes. Amen. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Aaron. If no one else has anything, I just want to share. You mentioned you mentioned treasure four times in your teachings. Um, and I just feel that someone needs to hear what I'm about to say about treasure possession, if I could. Mm -hmm. uh, further down Deuteronomy 26, you didn't read it all, but further down Deuteronomy 26, it says, And the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasure possession, as he mm -hmm. promised, and that you are to keep all his commandments. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor, high above all the nations he has made, and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God, as he promised. So the Lord promises Israel in this parasha that if they keep his commandments, they will be his treasured possession. This promise is also found in Exodus, where it says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me the kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And um, in Exodus 19, 5 and 6. So although they have experienced many curses over the generations, in the Haftarah, in the prophetic portion in, in, in Isaiah, the prophet uh, tells that Israel, that God is his favor and mercy that one day exalt them, even in the midst of much persecution and hatred against them. It says in Isaiah 60, verse 15, Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, with no one passing through, I'll make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. So in the Brit Hadashah, all followers of Yeshua are called God's special people. Because of our covenant with the Almighty God through the blood of Yeshua, both Jew and Gentile together can know that they are God's most treasured possession. First yes. Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So in Hebrew, the word for treasure is segula. The color purple in Hebrew is segol, a word that comes from the same root letters. Purple is the color of royalty. As the, Lord, as the Lord segula, we are clothed in segol, the color of royalty. So we are children of the king, and he is our father. He values and treasures us. There is no need to search for external or superficial qualifications. This is simply our identity in the Messiah Yeshua. We might look at ourselves and say, I don't look like a treasure. I'm too short. I'm too tall, too fat, too thin, <laughs> not pretty or fine enough to be a treasure. We might check in with our emotions and say, I don't feel that I qualify to be called the treasure of God. I have so many faults and weaknesses. I need to work on keeping my temper. I'm not yet disciplined enough. I don't witness enough. Whatever we perceive to be our weaknesses. But as the Apostle Paul says, we ought to put no confidence in the attributes of our flesh. Certainly, if anyone could have qualified as a treasure by the certificates on his wall and trophies on his desk, it would have been the Apostle Paul who described himself in this way. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to, to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, fault. He considered himself without fault in the flesh, in his keeping of the Torah. Yet we put no value on all of these external qualifications. Instead, he put his trust in the person of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah. But whatever, uh, but whatever we were, were gains to me, I consider lost for the sake of Messiah. What is true, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Messiah Yeshua, Adonai, my Lord, for, the, for whose sake I have lost all things. Philippians says, I consider them garbage, that, they, that I may gain Messiah and, and be found in him, not having a, the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Messiah, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Although Paul continued to keep the law, he understood that his excellent performance was not to be compared to the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith or trust. And while our own performance may not be as righteous as Paul's, we must accept by faith that if we are empowered to walk Adonai's ways by his spirit and are obedient, then we are in truth his special treasure. Despite our faults, weaknesses, and imperfections, the Lord loves and values us. And we can say, I am, I am, I am royalty, a child of the King of Kings the segula of the Lord, a, a precious treasure. His value, he values us because we're in his covenant children. We are created in his image and likeness, a spark of his divine she shekhinah, glory is within us. If we have, if we, let's say we have a hundred dollar bill and it accidentally drops on the ground, getting, getting swallowed, stepped on, crumbled, and beat up, is it worth any less than a hundred dollars? No, we know it retains its value. So too is with us. Many of us, however, do not understand our value. Some of us have not always been treated like a treasure. Perhaps parents, schoolmates, spouses, or fellow believers have not treated us with honor and respect. We may have even been abused or mistreated terribly by people if we are so, as if we are some, someone inconsequential. But God does not see us this way. Even if we have been broken, even if our heart has been torn in two or our whole life shattered, we have still a beautiful treasure to the Lord, a crown of beauty and a royal diadem. In the hand of Amen. God, they are fifty-two-three. How do we? How do we? How do we care for treasures? We put them in special places and guard them jealously, keeping them in a safe, secure place. Can we even fathom the grief and wrath of God feels when someone causes one of his segula to suffer? We need to leave these injustices and hurts in the hands of the Lord, who says He will vindicate us. Yeah. Our only choice is to forgive those who have hurt and mistreated us. Mistreated us. Sometimes we don't see ourselves as valuable and worthy. Of respect, we send signals to others that we are valueless and worthless. The result is often that we we will be treated as such. Mm. If our uh, or our perception of how others treat us can prevent us from moving forward in God's promises. For instance, when the Israelites saw themselves as grasshoppers, they thought that the giants in Canaan did as well. But when we begin to value and respect ourselves in a balanced and godly manner, we will find more and more that the people in our lives properly value and esteem us as well. Part of our healing and recovery is a transformation in the way that we see ourselves. Knowing identity in Messiah is righteous, whole, precious, valuable, 
We receive these precious attributes only through his divine covenant. So the bottom line, Aharon, is let us enter into everything that God has for us. Our freedom from condemnation, freedom from the curses, joy unspeakable, and peace that passes all understanding. All these and more have been given to us through the new covenant, the Brit Hadashah, brought with the precious blood of the sinless Son of God. Who And who is that? Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Gary, wow. when did you write that? Uh, I wrote it last night. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Thank you. Good job. Good job, Gary. Gary, that was spectacular. That and oh. and it it made me think of of archaeology and things that are found in antiquity. Sometimes when you find something, you know, it can be dirty, it can be grubby, you don't know it's valuable, You, but then you ne might need to polish it, you might need to fix it, you might need to get some glue, whatever. Um, and, and, and isn't that how God treats us? Uh, when he calls us treasure, yeah, we, we may look at the, the cracks, we may look at the dirt, um, but he's polishing us up. He's fixing those cracks. He's 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 making us more and more and more uh, desire. I don't know what the, what words are, but um, we are precious. How he how he finds us, and 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 he's making us even more and more precious. If, yep. if I can use that uh, mm -hmm. terminology in antiquity. So I've told you before, my career is in ruins. So um, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <Jeez>. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're a segula, a special, a special <laughs> people. Can you send a copy of that, Gary? I I wouldn't know where to send it to. Sister. I don't know anyone's email addresses right now. Send it to Dee Dee, and she can uh, and ask her to send it on, Gary. Oh, okay. Yes. And then and the notes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be good. That would be great. <laughs> Praise God. Didn't Good. mean to do your friend to my brother Aaron, but I wanted to no, no. add to what you said because you mentioned we mentioned uh, treasure like four times in your teaching. Oh, so. oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, wonderful, Gary. Thank you. Well, um, let me give uh, one one more opportunity as if anyone's got anything to share. If not, I will pray. Father God, thank you and bless you for this word of yours that is just amazing to us and enlightening and transforming. And Lord, may we we may we lay hold of it. May we rise up with it and run with it and strip off those um, like Lazarus who was alive and yet he had all the that dead bandage wrapped around him. Lord, may we rise up. Uh, 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 and be who you've called us to be, Lord. Fighters, priests, uh, treasured possession. And thank you for the affirmation that you give us through your word, Lord. Yes. We just praise you and we thank <laughs> you, Lord. And we just thank you what you're doing in all of our lives, even though at times, Lord, we don't understand and it's frustrating at times. But we trust you, Lord. We thank you and we bless you in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Gary. Yeah, someone, someone just thank needs you. to hear. Thank someone, someone just needs to hear that you are a treasure, treasure possession, no matter what anyone says about you, no matter what thinks about you. God loves you and he will always love you. And um, you are very, very special in his eyes. In his eyes. So please keep that in mind. Uh, yeah. If you would please unmute, receive the blessing of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you very much. All was well, well, a blessing to be in your Bible study, all special people. And uh, I pray for protection all of you. And God is protecting you, God. And he has a special purpose in, in the, all of life. Thank okay. you, Margaret. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. God bless you. We love you, Margaret. Thank you so much. God bless you. Margaret, Thank receive you. the blessing of the Lord. Yivarechicha denai v'dish melecha, yair denai p'navalecha v'echonecha, yisai denai p'navalecha, yisem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift us down upon each and every one of you and fill it overflowing with his peace. And shalom. 
Amen. Amen. Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. In the name of our Lord, Moshenu Aridima. Tell you as wonderful counselor, El Gibor, mighty God, Aviad, everlasting Father, Bar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Ari Yehuda, the Lion from the tribe of Judah, yes. Adonai Rofeka, the Lord who, who heals, restores, and makes whole, Avinu Sheba Shemayim, our Father who is in heaven, Melech Olam, the Eternal King, King Yeshua, and of course El Shaddai, our all sufficient God. And all of God's people says, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless. Amen. God bless. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Have Aaron. A... Get some Amen. rest. Thank you so much. I will. Thank Enjoy. you so much. Thank Enjoy you. your time with your family. Yes. Thank you. I will. I will. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. You're Thanks, welcome. Gary. Thank you. And Trent, welcome. thank you for sending and out Dee Dee. the notes and, and all your Trent. help. You're welcome. Trent, welcome. Thank you. And Gary, thanks. And listen, um, I'm I'm gonna duck out, but feel free if you guys want to stay on and chat and schmooze, you are welcome. Um, but love to you all, Shabbat Shalom, and thanks. Shabbat Blessings. Yeah. Will you be on Bless Brandon you. next week? Monday? I will. He, he just texted me. He said on Monday, which will be probably one in the afternoon, I will be giving an update on Brandon's. Yes. Great. We'll see you there too. All God right, bless. great. Thanks, Audrey. Bless you. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Bye. Bye. Shabbat shalom. Everybody. Shalom, Didi.